Excellent. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, it's my first time at the BCS, so it's uh, very exciting to be here, and thank you very much for having me. Um, so today I'm going to talk about failures in firmware of IoT. Um, by this I mean I'm going to talk about real weaknesses that are actionable in Internet of Things devices that can be used by an attacker to break Internet of Things devices in their entirety. I'm going to start by uh, defining a few simple terms, which some of you may know, some of you may not know, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page with some of the things I'm saying. So, firstly, we're going to talk about firmware. So firmware is pretty much any software that's running on an embedded device, usually run from flash memory, EEPROM, or RAM. It very much doesn't mean a clear thing a lot of the time. Uh, we have encryption, which is a well-known topic, especially in this crowd, um, which has a symmetric and asymmetric version. Symmetric, which is using the same key to encrypt and decrypt something, and asymmetric, which is used with a private key and a public key, where the public key can encrypt something and the private key can de decrypt something. Um, signing is the other side of asymmetric encryption, where a private key can verify, uh, make sure that a user can verify a specific message was from someone because they own that private key, and the public key can be used to verify that message against something being sent to them. So let's talk about open source and IoT a bit. Um, one of the big things that we see in IoT nowadays is embedded Linux, which you see in pretty much every device that I test a lot of the time when I work on hardware testing. Um, part of my job is basically a client or it will give, give me a device that they've created and tell me exactly what they want me to get out of it, if they want me to hack it, break into it, or break the networking protocols around it. Um, this whole platform is very dangerous because people make it extremely easy for an attacker to gain access to the firmware, modify what's going on, and put backdoors in it. Um, a huge amount of development and development environments for the chips like the MSP430, ARM chips, etc., include example code and devices, which make it a lot easier for someone to assess and reverse engineer what's going on with full source code available. Open source libraries such as OpenSSL and um, different uh, real-time operating systems such as ECOS provide access to users so that they can um, change the uh, code as they want to modify what they need it to do or just to implement it as part of their device. As we go through, we're going to talk about some different elements of weaknesses in embedded devices. Now, we're going to start off with the very basic terms, and we go through an example of how someone could go get about breaking, for instance, the encrypted firmware update mechanisms for a device in explicit detail. Um, so developers, especially in IoT, don't often consider the security implications of what they're doing, especially from the get-go. What they often do is develop a device and then consider the security, which means they've got a device that can't be changed in hardware, which is stuck with huge vulnerabilities that someone can't change later. Tools that are used for development, such as JDAG debuggers, SPI analyzers, logic analyzers, are all used for exploitation of these devices as well, which mean that the attackers and the developers of these devices are basically using the same tools to do the same things, except one is trying to do it against something they're not creating. Some weaknesses are purely inherent to the hardware, which this can be in chips that have firmware readout protection mechanisms that can be bypassed, and some are in the software that's built into those chips. So here's my first example. This is the NX301 ODB2 reader. Now, this is just an ODB2 reader I bought off Amazon for £20, uh, but it has a few mechanisms in it that would make it a really good target for an attacker. Firstly, it's using an STM32 F10. Can I just interrupt you? Because we are live streaming this, but we're live streaming it on the wrong channel, and no one can hear it. Oh, so terribly I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> you stay there. Okay. I've, I've wrongly set up and I apologize to everyone. Because the office is moving, we are using completely non-standard technology to stream, and um, okay. we're not used to it. Just two seconds, and no problem at all. it will be yours. Yes. 
you're talking about uh, haunting devices or devices being vulnerable. Yes. Aren't some vulnerabilities or aren't some devices made vulnerable deliberately so that uh, end users and the owners can update it? For example, Android phones. Um, certainly, yes. Uh, yes, certainly. So um, the topics we're going through today mainly are to do with devices where someone has tried very hard to stop you doing that. Um, there are definitely are cases where people have set up a device in a certain way just to allow someone to attack it if they want to, but also harden it against external attackers that aren't attacking that device. Yes. A lot of these, a lot of the, the buttons are used to, 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 to support. So how are they exploiting those as well? Um, not really. So the attacks we're going to go through today are mainly for someone, a consumer or an attacker who is a consumer, taking a device and modifying it to their own ends. So we're not really going to cover that topic too much today rather than... It's more about outside actors against the devices. Someone who's developed the device could put in any backdoor they want, which is the main concern of a lot of these things. Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, yes? What's your opinion of hardware security modules in the security? Hardware security modules are an excellent thing. They're often um, misintroduced into devices. I see them quite a lot on IoT devices where they set up an a AES um, accelerator to use a hardware security module where they implement AES and store the keys on that encrypted device. Um, but then you can often just pull that thing off and use it to decrypt and re-encrypt data as you want, which is something we see quite often with some devices. People. You know, there's a whole industry startup of digital custodianism of digital assets, I store sort of private keys in HSMs or a grid of HSMs. Uh, yes. Do you think that's a secure? Um, it can be secure. Um, it's definitely more secure than just storing it in a, some of the devices we're talking about today. However, they're still vulnerable to things like timing attacks and glitching attacks, where an attacker can modify the physical hardware around that device in order to assess things like if it's an AES accelerator, like I just spoke about, if someone were to, say, run a, a piece of encryption through that, they could use the timings and the power consumption of that chip in order to assess the encryption. And those are some known attacks that have been going on. And there's tools that have been built for it. Yes. Okay, um, this tool is used by uh, mechanics in order to um, check like the status of your vehicle. So they plug a uh, big plug into the bottom of your car and it allows you to uh, assess whether there's any issues with like the airbags or the wheels or the power steering. It allow allows them to clear out those messages or just modify them or just assess them so they can do things like your MOT. Now this one is quite a cheap device. Um, we're back up and running now, so I'll uh, continue. Um, so I chose this device particularly because it had a specific chip on it, which is incredibly vulnerable to some of the attacks when they come through. Now, this one in particular um, updates via USB. So you plug it into your computer and you can deploy new firmware updates to it. Now, what I noticed about this before I started was that all the firmware payloads that were downloaded from their website and sent to the device were all encrypted. So an attacker couldn't just modify that in the raw in a hex dump and modify what they want to do. So... One of the things that we'd want to do is identify the firmware updates that are going on. This one, it had a handy tool that came with it on a CD when I bought it, um, which basically allowed me to update the software just at a push of a button. I looked around how this worked and found that it just made a request to a website to download the latest firmware of the device and modify what it did. Um, and this could be very easily snipped by an attacker who knows how to assess how USB protocols work. For this, I used a small tool called uh, BeagleBone Black, which is something like a Raspberry Pi, except it has the capability to act as a USB analyzer. This being a man in the middle between a host device, say a computer, and the device itself, so I could assess all the protocol going through. Now, this is usually unencrypted, but the firmware payload being sent through it was encrypted. So I had to reverse engineer how this worked in order to identify exactly how it worked and implement my own update tool from this, which is a fairly simple task. It used CDC communication, which is basically serial communication over USB, and a CRC16, which was easy to assess at the end of each packet. This allowed me to basically make a whole new tool myself in order to assess, um, in order to upload the firmware. Now, at this point, I couldn't modify the firmware because it was all encrypted, but I could upload a firmware that someone else has made to the device. Um, so yeah, I, updated, I created a tool in LibUSB, which is a very common lib, uh, USB library used in Linux for developing USB host device um, functions, and I basically pumped through all the packets that I saw in the analysis in order to perform the same thing. 
It used a very common CRC16 used for error, error checking, which is x.25, very simple. And the firmware was sent in 512 byte blocks. So each piece of the firmware was just sent every 512 bytes in their own packets. Um, so, sorry, I think that went extra. No, okay. um, so what I did was attach the debugger to the device. Now most ARM chips, etc., will allow you to connect to what's called the SWD port. Now this is a debug port which allows you to write code to the device when you're developing for it, or read and write memory in order to debug it as you're going along. Now, on most devices, especially ones where people haven't really thought too much about the technologies going on and the attacks that could occur, um, we'll just have that header on the board and you can just plug into it and start communicating with it. In this, in this uh, instance, the device had locked me out from reading the flash, which is where the pure firmware was. And if I could download from that, I would have access to the whole thing straight away. Um, however, there is a weakness in the hardware of this chip, which allows you to still read and write the RAM, despite the fact that the flash memory was locked on the device. Um, because of this, I couldn't work out what the encryption algorithm was, but I would probably have access to the encryption keys as they were going to be stored in RAM in order to decrypt the packets as they were being sent over USB. Um, I sent some of the firmware update, the first 512 bytes, to the device and then read the RAM, which will, firstly would crash the device, but then also allow me to see exactly what was going on on it. This would allow me to uh, see what firmware was being uploaded in a decrypted form and look through that and assess what I needed to do. What this would do is give me access to this firmware if I wanted to, but would not give me access to how the encryption works, how the verification works, or allow me to modify the bootloader, which is the device that allows you... That the software that allows you to modify that firmware and handles the firmware updates. So, because I need to modify the encryption, I need to find out what kind of encryption it was, which is the key thing in this project, because I already had the encryption keys, or at least probably had them in that RAM payload. The first thing I did was XOR a single byte of that payload being sent. Now, if only one byte changed in the data that was sent and found in the RAM, that would mean that it was using a stream cipher, and it would be a very basic way to find out exactly what encryption was being used. And from there, I could just take that payload and take the RAM, put them together, and then I would have an encryption key stream allowing me to just de decrypt and re-encrypt any data I wanted for the device. Unfortunately, that wasn't it. If it was using an a ECB mode AES encryption, that would only change one block of the device if I changed one byte of the device. So that would be one 16-byte or 32-byte block, depending on the algorithm being used. Um, unfortunately, again, that wasn't what was being used. If I was using CBC mode, I would change the second block of the device, and I would see everything change apart from that first block, because that wouldn't be modified by changing something in the second block, because CBC mode works as a sequ sequential uh, uh, encryption algorithm. What I found was that it was using XXT encryption. Now, this is very easy to spot because it will take the entire encrypted payload that you've got and use it as one massive block. So if you change one byte anywhere in the 512 bytes, the whole payload would change, and you'd see that in the RAM. It would just be completely different. Because I knew what this was, I could process through the entire um, uh, encrypted firmware payload using the RAM and find the encryption keys and decrypt the entire payload from this. And I did this and got the encryption keys, which is four 32-bit values, which were the ones laid out there. Um, this basically would allow me to re-encrypt and decrypt any firmware I wanted, allowing me to change the device into anything I wanted to, or find secret information in this firmware. It would allow me to modify this firmware. It would also allow me to write shellcode to the existing firmware I had in order to gain access to the bootloader, which is the key thing here. If I had access to that, I could fixed devices that had their flash erased for whatever reason, or modify things going on on it. Um, change the encryption algorithm, change exactly what keys are being used, lock other people out of this device if I wanted to. So here is a, a bit of ARM uh, assembly code. It's very simple. All this does is dump all the contents of that bootloader into the RAM of the device, which I could then read out via the debug port on it. So the first thing it does is put a small magic number into the memory so I knew exactly the fact that this code had run at some point because I still didn't have access to debug this in any way because the flash was locked. This then basically processes through from hex 08 and lots of zeros, which is the uh, vector in flash in memory, and puts it into zero lots of zeros, which is the RAM. Um, and then does an infinite loop in order to um, stop the thing running further. 
Very simple, but very effective and gave me the entire access to the bootloader, allowing me to modify the device later or fix it if I broke it during any more reverse engineering. So here's what it looked like originally. This is just the uh, firmware that would usually be deployed, decrypted, which I pulled out using the encryption keys I found earlier. And there is the modified section. So what I did is I compiled that assembly into bytecode and then just dumped it in what's called the reset vector of this chip, which is basically what runs first, which is set from an address at the top of that data. And as you can see, I started dumping out the bootloader. So the top is the magic number, that's the BBAA that I set in, and then the rest is the actual code that was running on the device on startup, including encryption keys, any secret data that the developer put in, or anything like that. So as I had knowledge of this firmware update, I could now modify anyone else's devices who had bought this without having to make physical changes to the device just by plugging it into my USB port and running my firmware update tool that I'd written which allow me to make this a device that anyone can buy and modify or test without having to make too many hardware changes, which would be useful for an attacker or a reverse engineer who wants to do things. Now, me in particular, the device that I made out of this in the end was a USB rubber ducky capable of emulating a keyboard so that when you uh, select from the menu of the screen, you could make it execute exploits on someone's computer when you walk up to it, literally typing out commands in order to attack the device and give you a backward backdoor into it. Now let's talk about embedded Linux a bit. So uh, that was uh, raw firmware here. Literally someone's programmed that from start to finish. That's exactly what it does. Embedded Linux is a lot different because people often use it for um, easy to implement stuff. They will take a chip, a system on a chip with some flash they'll or an EMMC and lo load Linux on it, add their tools and make it run from startup. And it's pretty much just a Raspberry Pi when you look at it from the right perspective, which will allow you to do whatever you want. Most vendors are, release, are obligated to release their source code from this, so Linux obviously is open source, as we all like, uh, which means other people, when they use it, have to release their source if you ask them to. Um, what vendors often do is try and hide this fact and put very secret pages on their sites which include this, but you can find them if you look hard enough. Um, lots of these vendors also use outdated kernels, usually 2.6, um, which is a very old ARM kernel that people still use to this day with out-of-date security mechanisms, and they just disable lots of features in order to make that slightly more secure, but not really. Attack tools, um, such as BusyBox, which has a whole suite of facilities for an attacker, or Nmap or anything else an attacker would want to use on that device can easily be built statically and just dumped onto a Linux machine in that way. Um, and often, because people trust Linux to be this secure, they don't secure their firmware updates properly and just make it in a fashion that anyone can modify it if they want to, even though they think no one will try, because who's going to try that really? Well, I did, so uh, let's go for that. So uh, this is the uh, Motorola Focus 85. This is the smart camera I use at home, even though I know it's incredibly secure, insecure. It's a Wi-Fi-based IoT camera, and while it looks like a camera, it's pretty much just a Linux box inside a case. Um, it allows for viewing and controlling the camera remotely. It updates the firmware via an app, and none of those firmware updates were encrypted, signed, or even had any kind of error checking. So if I modified the app, I could add my own backdoors into that device. Only mine, though. So first thing I did was download the firmware update app, which is called Hubble Firmware Upgrade, which is very helpful. I got that off the Play Store and downloaded it to my phone. I extracted it, so all Android applications are literally just a zip file, which includes Java code and any resources it needs. You can tear this apart and find all sorts of interesting things. From this, I found a tar file, which is just an archive file, which included all the firmware that would be deployed to a user's device. At the root of this, there were a few different things. These included kernels, bootloaders, etc., but also what's called skyifs.tar.gz. This would be the root file system of the device. Now, if I can modify this and add my own, say, telnet service to the device or over shell, I would now have access to that device as if it was just another Raspberry Pi, Linux machine, whatever we wanted. So I, I untarred that, and that had just a Linux root file system that someone could modify if they wanted to, pack it back together again, pack it back into a tarball, and then send it to the device, and that device would just use it and download it. And as soon as it rebooted, you would have access to the back end of that device. Obviously, that's great for attacking your own device, but it wouldn't allow someone to attack the rest of the firmware on the device. Um, what people would do is um, gain a backdoor to this device, having bought one, but then use it to attack the remote infrastructure 
of the IoT camera. So lots of people obviously are in this IoT camera, they all have to speak to a remote server. If there were weaknesses in that remote server that were hidden due to the fact that the APIs involved were inside that camera, there's nothing anyone can do about it unless they had access to that camera. Now what most people do is use a unique identifier for the cameras, which is easily modifiable and uploadable to any device they change, and hijack other people's cameras, or just find weaknesses as if they were just another hacker on their Linux box, which a lot of people seem to do, and becomes a large part of my job a huge amount of the time. In addition, people can sell this device in CEX with a backdoored firmware in it, and get access to someone's house from the internal network. <laughs> um, so now we're going to talk about weaknesses in unencrypted firmware. Obviously, the last device was unencrypted, but I wanted to go through a whole hack that I did recently on a particular piece of equipment, which got me a CVE, which is a, what's the thing? Security uh, certificate. Yeah, that's the one. A vulnerability that was um, officially registered um, by Siemens, who were the uh, particular target on this device. Now, the important thing about this particular hack was I did it without ever owning the device when I pulled the hack. I just had the firmware for the device. And what I did was called static analysis, which is basically assessing the firmware on a device or software on a device without ever being able to use that device in any way. Even if the firmware was signed, someone would be able to uh, attack these weaknesses just because they're inherent to the firmware rather than the signature checking. This is the Scalance X200. Now, this is a network switch, an industrial network switch, usually used on ships and oil rigs. Um, to uh, segregate their network between people. It has a web application with authentication to it and configuration files which include things like usernames and passwords for people to obviously log in to modify the settings on it. Now this was a configuration file that one of my colleagues pulled off a device when they were on a test and sent to me along with the firmware asking me to find out if I could work out how the passwords work on it. Now, as we all know, if you're working with password encryption, you should always be hashing that password in order to stop it being reversible by an attacker in order to work out everyone's passwords. Unfortunately, in this case, he didn't believe it was, and I agreed with him, mainly due to the fact that those passwords were very small and didn't really fit the uh, purview of any usual hashing algorithm we see. So, the small size of the uh, hashes meant that uh, it was probably going to be some kind of small block cipher being used. The variable length on it meant that every eight characters, the size of the block would change, meaning one could easily assess what the encryption was, and made me think that it was either DES or Blowfish encryption, which are two um, 56 and 64-bit encryption algorithms used here. If I, modify, if I could work out what this was, I'd be able to reverse any passwords for this device, anyone I wanted. And one of the key things I noted was that there were two admin passwords there, which was going to be very interesting later. So the first thing we did was take this firmware payload, which was literally just an ELF file. This is like an executable file, but in this case was deployed to the device, and have a look at what it had inside. We used binwalk for this, which is a very common tool, which just assesses file signatures within a file in order to assess what's in there. So it started off with an ELF header, which was very common, then a version string for the VXWorks real-time operating system. Now this is a closed source operating system which uh, is very commonly used in routers and other devices like that because it's very easy to deploy and very well known. And then LDMA compressed data. Now I assumed that the main firmware payload for this was going to be in that compressed data and I was correct but I wanted to work out exactly what kind of firmware it was. Because I didn't have the device, I couldn't work out what the chip was. I had nothing inside so I decided to do this the hard way and look at a hex dump of the file. Now this for anyone who knows, is very obviously ARM code, even as a hex dump, because of the uppercase E's of every fourth byte of the device, or of the firmware. So every fourth byte there's an uppercase E, which means that the highest nibble of every single command there was going to be an E, or an always in ARM. Now this makes it very easy to spot ARM code on a device and basically dump it in and reverse it as easily as possible. It's just a very quick way of defining the file signatures going on here. I loaded it into IDA. Now, this is a very popular tool but used by reverse engineers, hackers, sometimes software engineers, um, that basically allows you to step through the machine code that runs software, essentially. Um, what this does is you give it a piece of software and it will convert all the ones and zeros into readable assembly code, which you can then assess in order to find weaknesses in it. So I loaded my um, software in and managed to get it to dump out into a legitimate file as ARM code, which would allow me to assess exactly what's going on on it. Now, 
I decided to bin walk that executable again. Um, so this was the decompressed section of it in order to assess if there's anything that was really interesting apart from that password encryption first. And the first thing I saw was the VxWork symbol table. Now this is a debug table that's kept in the VxWorks operating system, which includes the function names of every single piece of assembly code uh, in the device, meaning that I could easily assess exactly what functions were being called where and just step through and reverse whatever I wanted. Nice and simple. So I took this and I wrote a small script, which basically went through the entire firmware, took all the names of those symbol tables and mapped them out to each of the function calls. That means I could then search for words like password and find functions that were handling the passwords, step through that and find functions that were handling the encryption, etc., and very, very quickly get exactly where I wanted to be. Um, it was a very small script, literally just went through that table, found one pointer, which was the function, and the other one to the text, um, mapped them together, gave me things like func sys in it and func user in it, <coughs> names like that, which were just easy ways, easy mnemonics for me to get exactly where I want to be. Um, RAM can be identified easily by just seeing where things are being stored a lot. Now, I was very lucky here because that symbol table also included variable names that people have used when developing the software meaning I could easily find out where the RAM was, giving me a lot easier, a lot more chance of finding where things were pointing, finding global variables, that sort of thing, as you can see at the top there. As I said, I found function names, the word password in, which would probably be things for editing, storing, verifying the passwords, and found this one called CLI edit password set. Now this would at some point have to go through and encrypt those passwords and save them, giving me access to where that function was and the encryption was. It would be easy to find the variables being passed to that because they were stored in registers 0, 1, and 2 on, in the machine code and just passed through. Um, from this, I found that it was using the Blowfish algorithm, which is a very common uh, block uh, cipher used for encryption, um, meaning that I could probably, if I worked out what the keys were, reverse all the passwords on this device and all the passwords on any other device in deployment in the world for this, which, as I said, was on ships and oil rigs, etc. I looked through and I found a function called blowfish underscore test, which was a test function with specific constants, which I then Googled and found that the exact library they were using was available on GitHub, meaning I could use that in my own code in order to reverse these passwords. So yeah, just a test function with two very well-defined constants, uh, df333f2dl and the other one, basically allowing me to easily assess which blowfish algorithm was being used I could copy and paste this out and use it for reversing passwords. I managed to trace the encryption key this way, allowing me to uh, assess which values were being passed to each function. And I found that there was an admin password being encrypted with the uh, single key ELS underscore key. Now, this was encrypting the admin passwords, but was not encrypting any other user's passwords, which confused me a bit, but it became quite interesting what they were doing. It turns out, the developers of this device had made it so that that first hash, the one next to admin, was encrypted with a static key, this being ELS underscore key. The next hash was then encrypted with the decrypted admin password. Cool. I know. Um, it gets better. Um, uh, that password was always going to be ELS debug. Now, it's called ELS debug basically so they could synchronize and make sure the encryption keys matched that hash to make sure if an admin user updated their password, it didn't break everyone else's passwords. All the user passwords were also encrypted with the admin password, meaning if someone knew that, they could also decrypt this. But with this config file, I could get everyone's passwords. Things they could have done. So they should have removed that symbol table from their firmware because it makes it very easy to reverse every single part of this encryption so easily that it wasn't even funny. It took me a couple of hours in total to do this whole project. Firmware payloads can be encrypted. Um, that would stop me from being able to analyze it as easily as I did. I could just see exactly what that code was doing. If it was encrypted, I would have had to go through a lot more trouble and bought one of the devices in order to do it. Firmware payloads could be signed in order to prevent modification of firmware. So if I needed to modify it to perform any of these tests, I didn't, but if I did need to, it could have prevented that. And of course, they should have used a hashing algorithm rather than reversible encryption, which is just ridiculous. Now, I sent these results to Siemens, who were very thankful and very kindly fixed the issue and have deployed a fix and publicized it. And so that was matter resolved in the end. So thank you, Siemens. Now, let's talk about hardware weaknesses for a bit. Um, so these are weaknesses in the actual physical chips of a device that can occur. Now, 
everyone expects hardware to be absolutely golden and do exactly what it's told to. You write firmware to it, it runs it, maybe there's some issues if the board's designed a bit funny, but it should do what it said. However, there's always going to be issues with it. Now there's things like memory chips, which are available on devices. We can often have firmware read off it, or secret data, or something that can be modified. And most modern chips support protection of firmware, but don't do it very well in a number of different ways, which we're about to cover. The first of these is a very common IoT chip. This is the ESP8266. This is used in so many devices, it's not even funny. Now, there's a new version out that more people are using nowadays, but for years, this was what was deployed in order to add Wi-Fi to your kettle, your toaster, your fridge, whatever you like. It's Wi-Fi capable and allows any other chip to communicate with it via SPI, UART, whatever you like. Firmware and sensitive data can easily be read off it, though, because it has a SPI chip on the board. So with a pair of crocodile clips and a Raspberry Pi, I could get all the firmware off that device very, very quickly, and it's not difficult to do this. We're now going to talk about the STM32 chips again, which are my favorite series of chips. I use them a lot for embedded development and reverse engineering. They're a series of ARM-based microcontrollers. Now, they're a restricted version, which only use a reduced instruction set of ARM, but they're very powerful. They have a lot of different peripherals, like USB, SBI, clocking, screens, all sorts of things. But they also have facilities for blocking someone reading the firmware out, as we discussed earlier. Now, the F0 series, which we're talking about here, can have its firmware readout protections bypassed by turning the device on and off again very quickly while trying to read the firmware. And you can write, read a bit of it at a time, just incrementally. Now, it takes you several hours, but you'll get the whole firmware off that device if you just keep toggling that power and reading the firmware off it. Um, I've demonstrated this on several engagements with uh, clients, and it's the only real defense against it is use a different chip. There's then, <laughs> then there's the uh, STM32F1, which is a slightly more powerful chip in this series, which is not vulnerable to this attack. It will always block you and just crash as soon as you try to read firmware. However, it is vulnerable to power glitching attacks. By turning the device off and on even faster, say using an FPGA or uh, slightly more complex tools, you can make it skip the readout protection. So you're basically making the thing's heart skip a beat, essentially. As you're requesting firmware from it, you drop the power ever so slightly, we're talking in nanoseconds, and the chip will get confused and say, OK, my readout protection isn't on, and give you the firmware. So that can be bypassed with a certain amount of tools and a certain amount of skill. There's then the STM32F4, which is considered one of the most secure out of these chips as we go along. This is probably the most powerful in this series. These are not vulnerable to any readout protection race conditions or glitching or anything we've done before. But if you ask someone very nicely to take the top off the chip and shine a UV light in it while asking for the firmware, it will give you the firmware. So not much protection there either. But these are increasingly difficult attacks that as you go along just become harder and harder and eventually it's just not going to be viable for most people to do. A bit more, we're going to talk about the STM32. Now, this comes with a huge amount of open source example code, most specifically USB uh, functionality. So writing a whole USB stack is very painful for these devices. So they provide it all for you to the start with. They say, here's how you make a keyboard. Here's the all the code for a keyboard. Modify it to your heart's content and make a keyboard that does what you want to do. Here's a disk. Make it do what you want to do. And you can, because people take these and just dump them into their projects, and you'll see it in huge amounts of like uh, IoT projects and other embedded devices, they'll have just taken this code and dumped it in as they need to, willy-nilly. They're still vulnerable to the uh, weaknesses that are just present in those open source software because they don't get updated that often and there's weaknesses all over the place. If you found, for instance, a memory corruption exploit on one of these, you'd be golden on IoT devices for years. So. In conclusion, um, securing firmware against attack is obviously a very difficult process. People try very hard, but there are just different ways of getting it out eventually. The best thing you can do is make sure that you do your firmware in such a way that if someone compromises one piece of firmware, they won't be able to use it to compromise the rest of your network. Users have physical access to a device when you bu they buy it from you. They can do whatever they want to it. So what you need to do is make sure your surrounding infrastructure, your remote servers, your APIs, don't allow them to use that firmware, that device, to attack other users on your network. <coughs> Securing should never be an afterthought as well, especially in IoT, where you are putting connected devices in people's homes. If you are trying your best to make a secure device, you should be thinking about that from the start, not at the end. A lot of IoT developers, they build the device, they're happy with it, design the boards, even start manufacturing, and then start thinking, oh, there's some security weaknesses we should fix. If those are inherent to the hardware, like things such as the Nintendo Switch, which is vulnerable to a harder hardware exploit, they can never fix this unless they release a new version, which often they don't want to. 
And because of this, they just need to work very hard to secure things from the get-go. Now, thank you very much. Any questions? You first. Um, a couple of times you, you referenced the uh, debug interfaces. Yes. And I'm thinking on you know average arm ship, you've got your SWD. Yeah. All very nice. Uh, how would you go about securing that? Um, question, can you repeat the question for the tape? Oh yes. Um, so, uh, how would one go about uh, securing their device against SWD attacks on the uh, on the actual hardware of the device? What someone would do is first design their board, their production version of the board, to not have those headers on there. So usually there will just be headers designed on the board where you can just solder onto it and attack it. What someone, sh what people should do, is remove those headers completely so that on the production version of the device, someone can't just see it and plug into it. What then happens is an attacker would need to solder on very fine onto usually QFN size or TSOP size chips, which is very difficult, could damage the device, but they could still do it. What they should really be doing is enabling these readout protection mechanisms as they go along. Now the F4 that we spoke about earlier, it does have one stronger defense against this, which is a readout protection level two, which just stops any communication with the debug port and any communication with the flash except by what's running on it. And that can secure you very strongly against these things. Uh, this STM32 F4, that's the last one we spoke about, yes. Um, where did the theory of discovery come from for the power cycling and the UV techniques? Um, a lot of them are well known or in academic, academic papers. Um, oh, sorry, yes, correct. Um, where did my inspiration come? It wasn't my inspiration. Um, for the readout protection issues that we spoke about at the end, they are usually well-known ones or ones that have been done by research by universities, etc. The difficulty is a lot of them are very difficult to implement. So even the one where I'm just powering cycling the thing and asking for data, you have to write tools around it to do this, which is a complex thing. For the glitching, you need to work out how to use an FPGA or a chip whisperer, which is a device built for this. And for the F4, you need to have access to some really high-tech stuff, really. Chris, something that struck me was um, with the camera, you said that it can be, once it's resold on CX or whatever, eBay, yeah. it can be then used by attackers to pivot into people's home networks, for example. Is there anything that, that a buyer could do to remediate that or insert themselves against an attacker being able to do that? Uh, yes, so the question was, is there something uh, someone can do to remediate themselves against attackers um, deploying malicious firmware to second-hand devices that they've bought? Now, what an attacker can do is first, segregate their IoT and second-hand devices on a separate network from everything else. Um, they can also factory reset. So one thing people could do is put a backdoor in an Android phone. So just put it into the Android operating system. What a user should do is then just completely clean that phone, factory reset, remove all the firmware, and start from scratch. IoT devices are more difficult, and the best thing you can do is just limit exactly what that device can do on your network, because it's going to be insecure no matter what you try, really. Okay, so that, that camera that you, that you tested has no factory reset? Uh, it does have a factory reset. Oh, okay. That that what target was more about how you can break into that device and then break into the APIs and networking around it. We have time for just, just one more question. Okay. But there will be plenty of time afterwards and in the past for, for more questions. Excellent. Is it a software reset? Um, <laughs> it's not a software reset. <laughs> Um, he's referring to the STM32F1s, presumably. Um, I used a power reset where I literally tied the power to a GPI open on the, my reader in order to power it on whenever I wanted to, rather than using software resets, which they mitigate against. But, excellent. So I think that's all the questions.